very decent. Um, I think it may have been on the flight, but it went by so fast that it had it. Um, how do you actually access the portal? Oh, you uh, you will go on to um, the next one. This is the, um, the the website. Yes, this is at Central PR. These are the digital collections. So this is the front end of the, of the um, digital collection portal. Uh, yes. Um, so we don't have everything digitized yet, yet, but this is a great starting point to research and to learn about the holdings of the collections. Uh, we use it as a key reference resource for staff and archives, and since this allows searching across um, across collections, it provides a different view of the material and experience. So as you see, we have featured galleries, we have like recent added or histories, and we have our featured collections. So this is just like a slice of what we have. <laughs> One of the things as an educator, just in terms of accessing it, um, a lot of educators in New York City are very interested in bringing uh, the cultural, the Latino cultural experience into the classroom. And so that question is really important in terms of once we say come to this site, it might be very complicated for them to actually figure out a way to get to the video or the person or the year that they want to infuse in their curriculum instruction. And so this is going to be like an introduction to this work. And then at the end uh, of this presentation, um, you guys will be able to go downstairs and go through the library and have more uh, a better sense of how to actually access it either from the computer and also through the, the on-site location. Yes? I think just a quick technical question while that's up. Is the are the, the items available as individual items or only through the galleries and collections? Uh, well, they're, they're available as a digitized item. So, so there's so like a browse items, you can see the full, co the full collection too? You can see, yeah, you can see the, the full collection, but they are like individual records. So you right. can kind of go through it as a gallery. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. And are you working on uh, digitizing everything, all of the things that were in the slide that said library and archives? Yes. Yeah, so like, yeah, so like, like, so selective co collections that I am working on digitizing. So like the, uh, yeah, so like the, the Richie Perez collection, like we have like, um, it's still like in the process of all being put online. So it's like a, I think a few, a few of, of, of boxes of it have already been put online and then other ones are in the process. Yeah, and there were like thousands. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Yes? If they want to digitize for individuals, Yes, yeah. Great question. <laughs> and it's super fun to do it that way too, <laughs> the old school way, because you really get a sense of like touching the items. And um, a lot of the people there are from the old school, come back, you know, the people that I'm interviewing in the oral history project are in their 70s and 80s. Um, and so I really, I'm kind of in the middle of that spectrum, but I absolutely love the idea that it's being digitized. Um, but for me, I love sitting there for two hours and opening a big box, and it's so organized, and I'm like, oh my god, here are the, pho the photographs of this person's life, and if you were an artist, here's actual, you know, um, snapshots of the paintings and the exhibits, and it just brings to me, it makes me personally feel very close to the history of, of that person, so you can do both. and object types. So we have all these like individual collections here. So there's like records of the Spira, um, records of the Puerto Rican Equal Defense and Education Fund, the Real Gas collection. So we have like all these like separate collections that have been digitized and put online. This is our uh, object results page that we have. So like this is an example. So like if you go, like this is for the United Gloves parents. So that like if you go on here, you would see like each digitized item. So we have like, a thank you letter, a lot of correspondence, uh, we have flyers, uh, we have like, in like invitations, we have photographs. So really just like a lot of like yeah, a lot of like kind of like memor I don't say memorabilia, but like a lot of like selections and documents from like a particular collection. So like the United Yes, like the United Arts Parents is an organization that is really just like 
providing a lot of educational opportunities for, for like Latino children of the Bronx, as well as kind of connecting with their parents to be kind of very connected with their children's um, education. So um, a majority of the collection is from the 60s through the 80s. So when a person decides, and I'm kind of having a conversation with you a little bit yeah. because she's the expert on this, um, and I've only um, engaged in about four or five because I'm new to the uh, Centro, uh, when a person, uh, and I did Jose Buscalia, which was a, a beautiful oral history, and I might share that uh, towards the end. Um, when a person has an amazing life, <laughs> and they have boxes of their own material, some of them get as detailed as email clippings, or handwritten letters, snapshots of their family, snapshots of the community. Um, there is a process of them deciding to contribute those items which is a very beautiful contribution and also, you know, it's an important decision. Not everyone wants to reveal every snapshot of their life. And so there's a process of them saying, okay, I'm going to put these particular items in the box that kind of show and demonstrate the trajectory of my life and my thinking and my contribution to this field from a personal and professional perspective and I'm going to gift this to the library. Um, so I'm just giving you a little bit of the, emotion, the, the emotional weight of that. Um, and then the library you know, says, thank you. And then you know, part of her job is to say, we're going to take this letter that was signed by this <coughs> person in 1961, and we're going to actually digitize it, and then you can access it online or by coming into the library and holding it in your hand in person. So, uh, so yeah, so we have like, more search results. So like if you wanted to search for dance, so we, we have like all the like, these dance photographs and more, more object results. Um, we, uh, we follow archival standards for how we organize and display metadata. We use qualified Dublin Core and PBC Core, Public Broadcasting Core, for our AP material. And built into this metadata structure display is a focus on representing the Puerto Rican culture and identity and language use. We allow for a bilingual description in key fields, such as title, description, individuals, and organizations.
activism embedded within the Center of Puerto Rican Studies. I see I was getting a little ahead of myself in terms of this, so I um, uh, was the same order. Um, keywords and topics are developed in-house to reflect Puerto Rican culture stateside. We developed a base list of keywords to describe our collections based on an analysis of existing metadata <coughs> from the finding aids and digital objects. This list covers keywords, topics, events to describe the PR experience stateside, as well as as applied to our digital records. Um, one area we, we did not include is keywords for identity, because of um, labels like such as identity can be so personal, and terminology changes and shifts over time. So we allow people to identify themselves so that they can, you know, add to you know, add to the metadata to be able to, yeah, to, to correctly identify themselves. Uh, for example, if somebody described themselves as Afro Puerto Rican in an oral history, we can include that in a description. And these representations really help us over time, um, as well to get really accurate metadata. For another example, uh, one record for a play performance was supported by commenters who pointed out the actresses Marion Colon and Sonia Manzano, who were in the photos, so that we could later identify them and tag them under the individuals and organizations mentioned fields. So this is our um, sound and moving image records. They look very similar to image and text records. The main difference is that they contain administrative information about the recording and then descriptive information about the contents of the recording underneath that. So these are the yeah, entire so sound, like our audio records, and then the moving image records for their video records, which are also connected with our oral histories. So this is our uh, bodega exhibit that we had had. Uh, we had, um, this was on a couple of years ago, and this was a um, photo e exhibition that was talking about the history of bodegas in New York City. Um, a lot of the photographs were taken um, by um, uh, Gusto Martin. Uh, he did a lot of these, these photographs, so it was really kind of just like a great collection of kind of just looking at like a slice of, of new, 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 new York in life. So it's, Really cool to see. Yes, you can download the images. Oh, and 
can you secure them if you post your own image in the light box area? Is that possible? I'm not really certain about that, but um, I have information from our, 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 from our digital archivist where she'd probably be better equipped to answer that question. Can you download the like, audio and I'm, I'm not sure. Or, or so. I'm, I'm not sure where myself. Mm -hmm. to my colleague, Dr. Raquel Rios, and she will uh, talk about the oral history project. Which is kind of the same and totally different language. <laughs> um,
Did you not know what was happening during that time? And then I will revise the questions so that I can really capture and honor the contribution of that person. The reason why I'm saying that is because it's not about grabbing a story from a history book and putting it online, but rather it is an experience that a person goes through and designs it with us so that their voice is being honored in the way that they lived it, that their memories are being shared in a way that they remember it, which is very different than holding someone to facts or in some cases working with people in the media, in the arts or education. They're so used to having a very flat, singular dimension <laughs> photograph of who they are, and in this space, we really allow them to present themselves to the world that will go forth into the future. Many of them think about their children and then other Puerto Ricans that follow them. So these recordings are then transcoded and uploaded online and they go to these miracle workers uh, and we work together in terms of pulling out all of the important data that comes out in the interview, all of the dates that were me mentioned all of the names of people that they worked with or in their family, all of the towns that they lived in, where they traveled, organizations that they communicated with, so that they can also right, be part of that network and web of every other contributor online. That's amazing. Um, these are some of the uh, interviews that you will find. You will recognize Juan Gonzalez from Democracy Now!, one of my favorite journalists and writers. Um, Elizabeth Yanquet, who's in uh, the environmental justice. Uh, Jose Buscalia Guerretti, uh, sculptor, artist. Uh, I recently finished his interview. Super, super remarkable life that extends from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, España, Venezuela, and he, his life moves from generations in a way that really gives you an understanding of the broader context of how Puerto Ricans are infiltrating and impacting in so many ways that we are unaware of. Dr. Ricardo Fernandez, who is the first Latino president of a college in New York who was the sitting president at Lehman College for 26 years. I just finished his interview. Amazing and remar remarkable uh, individual. As you can tell, everyone that I meet and go through the process, I feel like they become part of my family. And Maria Aponte is also in the world of the arts. Um, <clears throat> The oral history project started way back in 1973, and we organized them by various collections. And if you see here that there's, in 1982, when we say there's a research task force, we're basically that, that my interpretation of these words in layman's terms is that there's advocacy behind this work. You have to galvanize people to value it and bring in funding and also to organize it in a way in collections that are relevant and meaningful to people who are actually interested in those particular individuals. But we want to bucket them in ways so that we can understand the patterns and trends that they bring to that field. Um, and it goes all the way down to the present day, and each collection has a variety of different interviews embedded in that category. Um, I am not going to go over all of these lists because this you can do on your own, and it's really about kind of opening up and looking at the collections and just going through them. I get a little overwhelmed with this, I have to tell you. When I first started <laughs> going into the collections, I felt like it's almost like going to the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? You go inside and you see an exhibit, and you're just like, oh my god, this is amazing. But then you come out of that room, and you realize there are like hundreds of rooms. And even if you stay in one room, you can go back for several different visits, and each visit, you pick up another detail. 
So similarly, that's the collection. You decide one day by a name, you Google a name, or, uh, you search a name, you go in there, and you spend some time. And when you start getting that glossy eye feeling, come out, right? <laughs> Put a little sticky note on your desk, and you say, you know what, I'm going to go back. Because the type of work that we do goes on for years, which means that it's in-depth and detailed. And so that, can, that creates uh, a little bit of effort on your part. Don't give it up, because each time you go back, there's another discovery. So the goal of the project is to interview the Puerto Ricans who have made a significant impact in their professional fields. And I will say, uh, the inside word is that we try to balance what we call high-level professionals in the field, people who have notable names, right? Juan Gonzalez from Democracy Now! Everybody knows him. But there are amazing educators who are working in the schools, in the community centers, um, that we might not recognize their name. And so part of our work in nominations and selecting who gets interviewed is to create a balance. And if you go onto the uh, archive and you look at the interviews for someone that you do know, go to someone that you don't know, right? That's the idea, because we're drawing you in. And then when you click on someone else, you say, oh my god, this, <laughs> this person's on 161st Street doing a pioneer in bilingual education, right? And that is the beauty of, of um, going through one at a time and understanding that we want to give voice to a, the widest range of the Puerto Rican diaspora experience. There are 288 interviews currently completed online. Uh, 288 interviews, 174 online. Economic development, community activism, health, community welfare, militaries. Uh, these are all what she had mentioned earlier are tag words. So when I engage in an interview with someone, and I'm going to show you a segment of what an interview looks like, when that's not online yet, um, I have to uh, choose the tag words. And just like Melissa said previously, if the tag word is not there, we have an interactive list that we can update them because it's fluid and it changes and, it and it's dynamic over time, right? Some elements of our history may not have a word or something that we used to describe it 25 years ago. Like the Afro-Puerto Rico, like when you say I'm an Afro-Puerto Rican, that's not what people were using uh, before, right? My grandmother used to say I'm a black Puerto Rican and now they're like I'm an Afro-Puerto Rican. And so our tag words mark the times and they grow as you move along. But we try to capture uh, the main topics that we think people uh, would be interested in. So I thought it would be nice uh, for us to just take a look at what an oral history would, uh, would look like. Um, like I said, there's 270 online. This is my most recent uh, candidate, I felt I fall in love with each person's story and each individual. I find it to be a very uh, personal and intimate experience when you're digging into their life and details and then getting them all the way to the final stage in which we sit side by side in a pretty small room with the camera going. I'm not on the camera, I'm on one side. It's really about the person and their voice and their experience. Um, and they're looking at me, and we're having a conversation. And to make that space safe and meaningful for both of us is a journey. So this is Dr. Jorge Cabinas. I'm going to share uh, a snippet of his uh, interview. Uh, he's, uh, he was a thoracic a surgeon. And he was born in San Dulce, Puerto Rico. And he is also the co-founder of the Hispanic Genealogical Society in New York. So let's see if we can get this and out. Today is Thursday, September 5th, 2019. I'm Rebecca Krios, and I'm at Hunter College on 68th Street 
in New York City, interviewing Dr. Jorge Camunas Muniz. Good morning. Good morning. Should we answer in Spanish or English? It doesn't matter. Como quieras. Okay. But I have the questions in English and okay. whenever you feel comfortable switching to Spanish, by all means. Okay. So I've done a little background research on you and you have had a long, quite successful career as a thoracic surgeon. Interestingly, later in your life, you co-founded the Hispanic Genealogy Society of New York. Can you talk a little bit about that? How your career in medicine might have led you to this interest in genealogy? What was the impulse behind starting a society such as that, researching Hispanic family history and lineage? Well, um, in medicine, when you uh, when you go to medical school, one of the first things that they tell you is that you need to get a person's uh, history. Uh, history usually of an illness, but uh, as part of the whole picture, you have to take uh, dwell into the family history. And uh, so I learned a little bit about it there. Uh, and in my uh, in my family, I have two two brothers, one older, one younger, uh, who died from a condition called Tay-Sachs disease. And this condition, they say, is uh, more common in people who have Ashkenazi Jewish families. Uh, as far as I knew, I didn't have any Ashkenazi. Jews in the family, but it always uh, was somewhere in my curiosity. Uh, so, you know, I asked my parents, uh, what do they know, and, and uh, they knew very little that was told to them at that time. There weren't any genetic counselors at that time, so... It was kind of sad for my parents, I guess they, they felt forced to avoid having more, more children. I was the middle one, and then there was this next one, Yoancito, he lived till he was three years old. It was very rough for my mom. Um, so I wanted to learn more about the family. and. Um, my mother has a very large family. Uh, she has 12 brothers and sisters. Uh, and uh, her father, my abuelito, he had, uh, I think, 11 brothers and sisters. You know, so it's kind of big. It was many first cousins, second cousins. Uh, one time there was a I saw an ad for a computer program to, to keep track of their family history. So I, I, I bought that right away and I started to put things on my own. And one time my parents were visiting us here in New York and um, we had nothing else to do. So we sat by the computer and I started putting all the uncles and aunts and cousins that they remember and you know, brothers and sisters of their parents, grandparents, um, and, and it was a good thing that I had a computer because it got to be pretty big. Um, at the end of that uh, conversation, lasted a few hours, I guess, and my mother said, Ay, yo no sabía que te gustaba tanto, que te interesaba tanto la familia. And, <laughs> because it didn't, but still, she, she didn't uh, appreciate. Uh, now I have left and started my life here in New York. And uh, so, in, in looking at the family history, I, I wanted to find more about the people that she told me. I wanted to confirm that. And uh, we went 
to a, a forum and I don't have a computer, I don't have that anymore, it's the AOL part of that. Uh, but they had a Hispanic genealogy form. And at that time, Hispanic was more like, like Spain, not so much the rest of us. Uh, but we, we actually, uh, we actually, uh, me, me and uh, a guy called Charlie Fouquet and Al Sosa, we, we uh, spoke with a guy who ran the forum, Dick Eastman. And uh, he was a pioneer in computer genealogy. We, uh, he made for us the systematic genealogy for us. And, um, and we started talking to each other and we had different experiences. And uh, from that, we figured that it was nice to, to share that with other people because we had had to, to struggle to, to find out ways to find your family. We found a place, La uh, Casa de la Herencia Cultural Contorriqueña, in 104th Street with uh, Otilio Diaz. And, and he welcomed us there. We had our first uh, uh, presentation uh, there. We had about 70 or 80 people. It uh, was uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, we had some meetings here in, in El Centro. Uh, and the uh, librarian, uh, Mary Mateus, a uh, miraculist, uh, Pedro Juan Hernandez, helped us, and the director at that time, Feli Mato, they helped us uh, get started with this organization. And um, our job was to show people how you could uh, look into your family history. Uh, and we figured out we needed to be to have something more formal, so so we um, we decided to incorporate a non-for-profit organization, and um, so the Hispanic Genealogical Society of New York was born out of our curiosity to find our um, family history, and uh, somebody had really turned us on, which was to. To, to show people how to find their uncle, their grandfather, in, in a record, people they didn't know about. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was like they were turning people on, you know, instead of turning on to me, they were turning on to me. <laughs> uh, and, and we could see it. And enjoy with them the joy they had when they found uh, you know who their grandfather was. The center had a big role to play in that in that uh, around that time they had acquired the archives of, of the uh, uh, I guess what was the Office of Federal Affairs, but the, the Oficina of Puerto Rico at, in, in New York and then Many uh, of us uh, had pictures, uh, and some people showed pictures of the ancestors that they had never seen. So they knew they had a, a father, a grandfather who would come to Puerto Rico, and marine tigers, or something like that. And, but they had no pictures, and, and so they had that. It was fantastic. And I feel a lot of emotion you telling the story personally and also the joy of working with others. And I also know many people are like, ah, you know. Why 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 is that so important, do you think, that connecting to your to your ancestors? What is it? I think the only way for us